It's time to eat. What are you hungry for? Sit down and get ready to consume an abundance of fantasy football knowledge from Ross Tucker and Joe Dolan. Feed me now! I'm starving! On the Fantasy Feast Eating Podcast. Yeah, let's eat, baby. This is the Fantasy Feast Eating Podcast. We are, of course, presented by DraftKings. Love those dudes, whether it's the best ball on the DraftKings app, more on that momentarily, or the DK Sportsbook app. Just use that glorious code, Ross. Those are the guys that hook us up so we can hook you up. I am Ross Tucker, former NFL offensive lineman. Most of you know that. Five teams, seven years Back at, in the 2000s, pretty cool temp job. Helped me get these broadcasting gigs with CBS and the Philadelphia Eagles and Westwood One, and which helped me launch the, the podcast network. Ross Tucker Football Podcast is three days a week in the off season. Jeez, it'll be five days a week again before you know it. And yes, we do always have an even money betting podcast every week. I thought Daniel Kaplan was really interesting on today's Ross Tucker football podcast talking about this Sunday ticket settlement or lawsuit and the verdict and all the all the words I really don't like ever using at all in life but have to every once in a while in the NFL related we will have another new show Ross Tucker football podcast this week the NFC East preview with Greg Cosell I don't know if it's going to drop tomorrow on the 4th of July, happy birthday America, or where that'll drop on Friday. My co-host for this show is the one and only Joe Dolan. He's the fantasy gangster. You can check him out on social media at FG underscore Dolan. You can check out the fantastic content they have at fantasypoints.com using that code 24 feast which is amazing. We love it. Joe, interesting time of year. By the way, you look very much like a pro golfer today. For those people that are watching, youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. Does the hat logo match the shirt logo? I can't tell. It it, it does not. This is just a combination. This is uh, this is sky top lodge in the Poconos here. Nice. Uh, I've I've never actually been, but my in-laws in-laws visit there. And this is mid pines. Uh, golf course, which is in the Pine Needles Resort in the Pinehurst area of North Carolina. I played there with Brawley uh, and a couple of other buddies uh, in in February or March earlier this year. I am very much not a professional golfer, Ross. As a matter of fact, you are speaking to royalty here. You happen to be co-hosting a fantasy football podcast with the world's worst golfer and the world's worst guitar player. I'm one and the same, baby. Just like uh, I gotta, I gotta add something to that to be the holy trinity. Fortunately, I'm not the world's worst best ball player. I was, I was profitable the last couple of years, but uh, I gotta pick up another hobby that I'm absolutely god awful at, so I can have be the holy trinity of hobby crappiness. That that that's what I need to do. It's so funny that you say that because when I got cut one time, Joe, I. I, I was waiting to get picked up, and I got my CDL because my wife has a family propane business. Mm. And 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 one of the guys said to me, he was like, oh, my gosh, Ross, do you have your hunting license? And I was like, uh, no. He's like, that's all you need to have, like, the holy trinity. CDL, hunting license. NFL player. <laughs> yeah. like, so you grew that up. That in- was like, like to him, <laughs> like to him, if you had those three things, yeah. your hunting license, your CDL, and you played in the NFL, like that's it. Like you, 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 you've rounded all three bases. So you grew up in Pennsylvania and you're not a hunter, right? Uh, same with me. I have I, hunted. Uh, yeah, since. I, I, I'm, I'm an avid indoorsman uh, with the exception of golf courses. And uh, no, I've never hunted. Um, I've been fishing like once. Um, I, I would definitely go fishing. Hunting's not for me, though, I don't think. I'll, I'll, I'll eat the, I'll eat the jerky. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have hunted a couple times now, and it's fun. And uh, I, I fished a couple times. I like the drinking part of fishing. 
I, I that that's the part I, I like of fishing. I like I the drinking part of just about anything, quite frankly, probably a little too much. Anyway, well, that blue light, yeah, let's go. <laughs> well, you know what? Before we get into anything, Joe, we have to announce the rest of our our best ball competitors. So, coming into today's show, we had announced five: Matt Mullen, Thad Sulik, James D, Robert Anthony, Joel Buckwalter. You and I have two spots in the DraftKings best ball. So that's seven, which means we should announce five winners today. We're not going to do that. We're not going to announce five winners today. Instead, we're going to announce six winners today. Because, Joe, I don't know if you remember this or not, but last year we did two best ball drafts with our listeners. Yeah. And both times, inevitably, there's one person that can't figure out how to do it. They, they cannot figure out how to sign up and get in our private DraftKings best ball draft. So I talked to DraftKings and I was like, listen, I, I can't handle it. I, I can't handle trying to walk this one person through it for our, so here's what we're doing. We have one extra person. The first 10 people other than you and I that sign up when I give them the email, and, and the code, they're getting in. One person won't, but don't worry. You will roll over to the next one, right? So you'll have a chance to totally redeem yourself the next time. But this way, we are able to start the draft and do it because next week, I believe, is best ball week at DraftKings, which is very exciting. So um, next week is best ball week, which I'm excited. And speaking of that, Joe... You have already been participating in a lot of best ball drafts, and we're doing it. See, we, this is the thing. If we would have thought of this before yesterday, Joe, we could have gotten this sponsored. What's the name of the girl who says, what's in your wallet? She's on all of those commercials. Uh, Jennifer Garner? Jennifer Garner. Oh, yes. Yeah. And I am terrible with commercials, by the way. I don't pay. My wife's like, oh, that's that commercial. Like, you'll know, a, you'll know a, uh, a, we will get to fantasy football, I promise. You, you know, like, oh, I know that song from a commercial. My wife is, always knows exactly what product it's for. I'm just, I just remember that I know the, the song from the commercial. Anyway, uh, I, Do I'm you even actually, know what product, what's in your wallet is? Uh, it's like, um, I think some, it's Capital One. Capital One, something like that. Yeah, what's but I, I know wallet? it's Jennifer Garner. Uh, so anyway, I, <laughs> yeah, anyway, yeah. Joe. Yeah. What's in your wallet? We want to know you how many about how many best ball drafts have you done so far? And how do you even know what's in your wallet? Do you have like a how do you track um, all of your your portfolio of best ball leagues? So what you do is I'm I'm on multiple sites here. Um, I uh, so the different sites do track your uh, your exposure to players. That's what it's called exposure. Um, and, uh, also the, I keep a spreadsheet of exposure as well, just to keep me, uh, keep me grounded across all leagues. I, every now and again, I, I go through and update that. Um, but there are the websites do track your exposure. I have done over 100 best ball drafts to this point. Um, and it's just a matter of which players do I like in certain pockets and, and uh, tracking all that and trying to defend why I have uh, these guys so high on my board, or if they're not so high on my board, why I uh, why I have been drafting them at cost. And and there's there's multiple reasons for all of that stuff. All right. Well, let's dive into it. And what's a good way to go about it? Based on draft position or uh, or. Probably or football position. Football position is probably the best way to go about it. Because all right, tell me about your quarterbacks. Okay, so my single most drafted quarterback so far is Kyler Murray. Um, I don't have anything particularly like unique to say about Kyler Murray. It's just that in the way that you draft quarterbacks um, in best ball leagues, you're all, always looking for some sort of correlation. You're looking mostly, most of the time, you're looking for a stacked correlation. A tight end or a wide receiver with that player. Um, I have Kyler Murray, and I have prioritized Kyler Murray on Trey McBride teams. Um, but I don't have Kyler Murray on all my Trey McBride teams because I also have Kyler Murray on Marvin Harrison teams. And Kyler Murray, to me, he just stands out as somebody 
right now he's carrying a quarterback 7 ADP, quarterback 8, depending on which site you're using. And he's a very affordable player for somebody with a dual threat skill set. You can typically get him in the 7th or 8th round. And so when I draft a Trey McBride, and and this, this all falls into my general best ball draft strategy this year. Trey McBride, Sam Laporta, Travis Kelsey to a lesser extent because – um, I said, I, I believe I, I dropped it on this show that I yeah, don't last think week. I don't think he's going to be a full time player. I think he's going to be a smart time player. I don't want to call it part time, uh, but I think the Chiefs are going to be. Um, I think the Chiefs are going to be smart with him. Trey McBride and Sam Laporta, knowing when to draft one of those kind of elite tight ends. It's a feel thing, and it's when you just don't like the running backs or the wide receivers are on the board. And the thing is that that's nice about those two guys in particular, that is not the, the truth about Kelsey, is they are extremely easy to stack with their with their quarterback uh, uh, teammate. So Trey McBride, if I draft Trey McBride in the fourth round, I can set up for three rounds expecting that I can draft Kyler Murray. Meanwhile, I can set up for eight rounds if I draft Sam Laporta, knowing that I'm going to go get Jared Goff. So Kyler Murray, to me, just happens to be the best combination of value at um, at his position in terms of his skill set, also having a high-end teammate that I can stack him with. Um, and... On a lesser extent, uh, Dak Prescott fits that. You just have to to get CeeDee Lamb. You need a top two or three pick. And um, I think Kyler Murray just fits that mold. The balance of his ease of being uh, of drafting him with the fact that he's easy to stack, especially even later in your draft when you can get Michael Wilson and Greg Dorch and Zay, and Zay Jones, I, it's been made Kyler Murray a pretty popular pick for me. All right, so Joe, I, I want you to hammer home again you probably talked about it before. Mm -hmm. Why is it so important that when you have Trey McBride, you get Kyler Murray, or when you have Sam Laporta, yeah. you get Jared Goff? Why? Why is the stack? Explain the value of the stacking. No, well, first and foremost, essentially, it, it's not exactly this because of the difference of scoring between positions, but you get double points, and in best ball. You don't have to make the lineup decision when you're starting these guys. So if you have Kyler Murray and you get Trey McBride, now in a standard league, you're probably starting both of those guys every week. But if I have Kyler Murray and then I have somebody like Greg Dortch down the board, well, you don't need to, in best ball, you don't need to know when to, to start Greg Dortch. It'll start him automatically if he has a seven catch game. So in best ball, if you want the big bucks, you're playing in a total points league, but you're also advancing week by week in the playoffs. So you want to maximize your ability to score spike points in spike weeks, which will be like weeks 14, 15, 16, 17, the playoff weeks for, for best ball in some formats. And you want to correlate your players in those weeks so that you have the ability to blow away the rest of the field and maximize your return on investment, which is why it's going to be impossible to get into in this show, but week 17 stacks are very popular in the best ball community. That blew my mind when I heard it like three years ago for the first time by a best ball mania winner. And I realized that it makes perfect sense. You want to play those later weeks. Like you're essentially like you're playing DFS when you play DFS and you want to take down a large field tournament, you essentially want to stack a game that you think is going to score a lot of points and correlate players from that game. So there's multiple layers to stacking the, basic and easiest for somebody to pull off is to simply stack a quarterback and a receiver or a quarterback and a tight end or multiple receivers from one team. Uh, and that that's kind of what Kyler Murray has been doing for me with Trey McBride. Got it. Who is your second most drafted quarterback? Uh, I have Tua uh, at Tonga Vailoa. I have, I have him as my second most drafted quarterback. He's tied with Trevor Lawrence. Both of these guys are really easy to get quarterback 14 quarterback 15. I have quite a few Tyree kill teams, just the luck of the draw, drawing a top three, top four pick in best ball. And then, so when I have Tyree kill, I certainly correlate that with Tua Tonga Vailoa, Trevor Lawrence. I have a lot of Evan Ingram. Evan Ingram is, is, part of the final tier of a, of a drop off at tight end. And I end up stacking Evan Ingram with Trevor Lawrence. So, and those guys give you a lot of flexibility. They can be your first quarterback on a three quarterback team, or they can be your second quarterback on a stud quarterback team. You might end up with say Patrick Mahomes and, and Tua Tonga Vailoa, and you have two quarterbacks you feel really good about. So stacking really dictates how I draft at the quarterback position. Those are the guys I have the most of doesn't necessarily mean those are the guys I love the most. 
but they are the guys I have the most of, just based on how the draft board felt to me. Got it. Okay, let's move on to running back. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you look, well, let me ask you this before: Do you have who who would be like your second quarterback in a lot of those? leagues so um i i've been typically drafting a quarterback like between the top eight and ten but here are the, here are the guys down the board who i have the most of uh, and and i'm talking about guys outside the top 16 kirk cousins matthew stafford i have deshaun watson um about th- that he's only about nine percent but kirk cousins and matthew stafford are at 12.5 percent and 10.7 percent those are the two guys outside the top 16 i have the most of so far Got it. Okay, now we can move on to the running back position. Yep. Typically, how many running backs do you have on your team, Joe? The the standard best ball, um, at least on a certain popular site, the standard best ball breakdown is two, five, eight, three. That's that's generally regarded as the optimal, which means two quarterbacks, five running backs, eight wide receivers, three tight ends. You tip. You, there are ways to get around that, but you would say typically five, between four and six is generally viewed as acceptable three and seven are viewed as extreme but in certain builds viable but i would say typically your typical best ball team will have five running backs on it got it okay and who are you getting for the most part so my single most drafted player in all of best ball right now and i was would not have predicted this coming into this season he was a prospect i liked but in terms of his skill level his competition and his price on draft day Tyrone Tracy of the New York Giants is my most drafted player. I have him on 35.7% of my best ball teams. And I will tell you, some people might reach out to me and say, 35.7% Dolan for your most drafted player means you're not taking strong enough takes. And that's fair, but this is a guy I've been drafting pretty much every time I've gotten the opportunity. He is a perfect fifth running back in best ball. He's a former college receiver who, look, Devin Singletary is their starting running back. But he's never really been a dynamic receiver. I think Tyrone Tracy can have value independent of Devin Singletary. He's somebody who's already been making plays in in mini camps. I expect that will continue in training camp into the preseason. He is my most drafted running back. Uh, Actually, quite frankly, by far at this point. A rookie running back, late round pick from Purdue. Yeah. Hey, that's just the way the cookie crumbles, man. you feel like that's a contrary play and that's why you're doing it or you you really feel good about it i i feel good about it and also it's cheap enough that if if i'm wrong about tyrone tracy i'm not going to care like he's like he's a 14 15th round pick okay but i just like the the combination of opportunity skill set a former college receiver who's now in a backfield where the main running back isn't a very accomplished receiver i want that guy like as somebody who can maybe carve out a role independent of of Devin Singletary. Again, not a guy who's probably going to be a great value in standard start sit leagues when you have to decide when you're starting him. But you know, if Tyrone Tracy earns a role as a receiving back here, he's going to have games when he catches four or five passes, maybe bust one off for a touchdown. And in best ball, I don't have to decide when that week is. It's just going to start him automatically. And what if there is Alvin Kamara potential? When you're when you're drafting in these late rounds, Ross, you have to change your line of questioning to yourself. In the first round, you might say, what if I'm wrong about Garrett Wilson? What if Aaron Rodgers isn't isn't the same after the injury? What if Tyrod Taylor can't come in and produce better than Zach Wilson did last year? When you're drafting somebody in the 15th round, like a Tyrone Tracy, the question you should be asking yourself is, what if I'm right? What's the upside here? And it's easy to see a pathway where Tyrone Tracy, look, he has an elite skill set. He went, he fell to the the he fell to the third round because he's older. He's 24, and he also uh, has only been a running back for one year. So there's a lot of reasons that he fell. But if he had more experience with the skill set, we saw our guy Brett Whitefield loved him. Uh, Greg Cosell loved him. He might have been a day two pick, and then we're talking about him in a completely different light. Got it. Okay, who's your second? Most popular running back. It's actually another rookie. It's Marshawn Lloyd. I expect that the Packers are going to employ a, maybe not a full committee backfield, but I think Marshawn Lloyd has an opportunity to take the Aaron Jones receiving role in this backfield. Um, The college football video game's coming out. He's a juke stick guy. Uh, Marshawn Lloyd is, he's dynamic in the open field. He's going to make guys miss. And I think there's an opportunity for him to carve out a role here, as Matt LaFleur has said. I mean, 
but he's competing with A.J. Dillon and Josh Jacobs, right? Uh, he's competing with both of those guys, but his skill set is way more dynamic than that of A.J. Dillon. And I talked to Aaron Nagler of Cheesehead TV, and he said there's no guarantee A.J. Dillon's on this roster. So uh, Marshawn Lloyd, he was, he was, I believe, a third or fourth round pick. Pretty good capital investment for a running back. I actually think Marshawn Lloyd has an opportunity to carve out a role, and is certainly a guy in Dynasty who uh, is looking up. Yeah, I think it says something, too, that they drafted him where they did even after signing Jacobs to that deal. Yeah, and Jacobs, by the way, is on a glorified one-year contract. So Marshawn Lloyd could be the lead guy as soon as next year. But that doesn't matter for best ball this year. But I'm just saying I actually think that they're going to get a good look at Marshawn Lloyd this year. Any other running backs you have a lot of? Yeah, I've actually, uh, the guy Marshawn Lloyd is replacing, Aaron Jones is too cheap for me at RB19 in, in Minnesota's offense. I really like him there. I've talked about my love of Isaiah Pacheco. I think if you go with a wide receiver heavy build, he's my fourth most drafted running back. If you go with a wide receiver heavy build early, I think you can get an underrated bell cow Pacheco at RB11. Um, and I also have told you I really like the second round running backs this year, Saquon Barkley and Jonathan Taylor. They are both in my top seven in most running backs drafts. Drafted. Wow. All right. I like it. Let's move on to the receiver position, Joe. Yep. Who do you have at the top? My number one wide receiver drafted is Dontavion Wicks from the Green Bay Packers. In terms of the cheapest of, of these guys uh, uh, who's available, um, in, uh, and I'm speaking of all the Packers wide receivers, Jaden Reed, um, uh, Christian Watson, Romeo Dobbs, and Dontavion Wicks, Wicks is the cheapest, and I found him the easiest to draft. In seven games above a 50% route share last year, Wicks averaged 37.6 receiving yards per game and 9.2 fantasy points per game. Um, while that doesn't sound like a lot, our guy Ryan Heath pointed this out, that was more than Jackson Smith in Jigba last year. And Jackson Smith in Jigba is going five rounds earlier than Dontavion Wicks. He mostly saw the field when Christian Watson was injured, but... Um, He's basically outperformed Romeo Dobbs on an efficiency standpoint. He was uh, he ranked top 15 in first downs per route run uh, last year. I actually think there's a chance Dontavion Wicks and Christian Watson end up the top two outside receivers for this team with Jaden Reed in the slot. At wide receiver 60, that's an easy button click for me with Jordan Love, the ascending talent at quarterback. All right, who's next? Jalen Tolbert. That's a week 18. That, I mean, that's a round 18 guy. That's a week eight. That week 17 correlation if you drafted Eagles. And it's really just who somebody's catching passes for the Cowboys, not named CeeDee Lamb. Who is it? You'll, when we get to my tight ends, we'll find, we'll find another guy I've drafted a lot of. Um, it's really just taking the guy who has the best chance. And the Cowboys are going to hype up some of these young players. Obviously, they drafted Flournoy in the sixth round. He was making some minicamp noise. But somebody's going to catch passes not named CeeDee Lamb. This team might throw the ball more than anybody in the NFL. And I'm just taking the opportunity with Jalen Tolbert in the last round. Your yeah. third guy, Joe? So uh, I have, two, I have four, three guys tied for third. Two of them are top three wide receivers like in terms of how you would have them on your roster those would be hollywood brown and dj moore i think there should be a wider gap between hollywood brown's adp and xavier worthy's adp and i've stacked him with patrick mahomes a ton um i think there's an opportunity for him to lead them in receiving if my kelsey usage prediction is correct dj moore Look, this is a guy who caught 90-plus passes with a quarterback who can't throw the football last year. I know there's more target competition, but the quarterback position is going to be significantly upgraded in Chicago with Caleb Williams. And another guy who I've been drafting a lot in the 18th round is DJ Chark. He's the most accomplished receiver. I know that's, you know, not a high bar to cross, but he's the most accomplished receiver on the Chargers roster right now. He is, he is one of my most drafted wide receivers because he's the cheapest of the Charger options that you can get. What about tight ends, Joe? So my number one drafted tight end, actually I have a three-way tie for first. One of them wow. is a top 10 in ADP. That's Jake Ferguson. Again, somebody's got to catch the ball here. My other two are available in double-digit rounds, one of them available in the last round. Tyler Conklin, I, I think he is severely underpriced at tight end 21 right now. And also on at 18th round, guy who got paid this offseason, Tyler Higby is injured, serious injury, might never be the same with the Rams. How about Colby Parkinson at tight end 30? And he's always a third tight end on my roster. Just like, I have no expectations for him, but the Rams paid him 
He's got opportunity here. They use tight ends in that offense. That there, there's the Kua Cup and then Demarcus Robinson. So I actually think there's opportunity here for Colby Parkinson. Next week, it's best ball week at DraftKings. Get fired up. I know Joe and I are. Can't wait for next week's show. I'm stuffed. We're done. Thanks for tuning in to Fantasy Feast. Make sure to also check out the Ross Tucker Football Podcast, Even Money, and College Draft, all on the DraftKings Network, YouTube, or subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. (laughs) 